CBS This Morning has a show on mental health coming up tomorrow, mm -hmm. and there have been a series of pieces around that, uh, uh, about learning uh, about stopping the stigma. And um, she has a new essay uh, on her website. Uh, this is the singer Alanis Morissette. Maria is standing by here. She actually interviewed Alanis Morissette mm -hmm. about postpartum depression. It's a really powerful piece. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that she struggled with sleep deprivation, fogginess, physical pain, isolation, and anxiety. And as you know, she's not alone. Mm -hmm. The American Psychological Association says up to one in seven women experience postpartum depression. Maria sat down with Alanis Morissette. Her songs are filled with raw emotion, expressing the feelings of a generation of music lovers. Now, Alanis Morissette is using her voice to bring attention to an issue she knows well, postpartum depression. This time around, it's less depression. It's more anxiety and a little more of the compulsive, obsessive thoughts. When you talk about invasive thoughts, like, yeah. what does that include, though? I mean, images that are horrifying, just a lot of times about safety, about the people you love, your loved ones, your children, and then me just having to remind myself, like, oh, nope, this is just postpartum depression swooping in. Again, stop. In a candid online essay, the mother of three opens up about dealing with postpartum for a third time following the birth of her son, Winter Mercy, in August. She writes postpartum depression, or PPD, is still a sneaky monkey with a machete working its way through my psyche. There is something about chronicling the experience in real time. If the goal is a stigma-free um, perception of any mental illness or mental health conversation, understanding and giving the details of what it really looks like from the inside is important. Your love is thick. The Grammy Award-winning singer first realized she was dealing with postpartum 16 months after the birth of her first child in 2010. My survival strategy is to just push through. And then I spoke with a, a professional who, who knew all about postpartum depression. I asked her, does this go away if I just white knuckle through it? She said, no, it actually gets worse. So as soon as I heard that, I thought, it can't get worse than this. Really? So then I, um, I went on medication right away. Morissette also approaches her recovery in part by meditating, leaning on loved ones, and turning to a familiar passion, music. When I'm in any state, um, emotionally sad, angry, freaked out, lonely, isolated, depressed... I can write. Thank God for that. Are there moments where you're like, it's gone, I'm cured? There are moments where I think it's going to be kind of easy, or I do get a little cocky. But I don't think of it in terms of cured, um, because I know that postpartum isn't something that lasts a week. You know, for me, it's, it's at least two years, maybe a little longer. Signs of postpartum depression can include anxiety or panic attacks, uncontrolled crying or sadness, fear of being left alone with the baby or lack of interest in the baby altogether. The American Psychological Association recommends that anyone experiencing symptoms for more than two weeks seek help. If left untreated, the condition can last many weeks or months. Was there ever a moment where that fear made you want to say, I can't do it again? Uh, no. Because I'd experienced the other side of postpartum depression and having this relationship, I know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I'd be willing to go through it again. I know that sounds a little insane, but, you know, I'm willing to uh, present sacrifice for future gain it. I've done it a million times. Very powerful conversation, so powerful. and we are joined now by Maria Viriel. Maria. You're not normally in New York, so we're very happy <laughs> to have you here. Um, did Alanis Morissette have a, any advice for women, uh, women who are going through it now, women who are anxious about the possibility of having to face postpartum depression? I think the first part is obviously admitting that there might be something going on, kind of like telling yourself it's okay to have whatever's happening to me happen, right? Mm -hmm. But then she also talks about 
having that support system outside, wh whoever that is, family and friends, and encouraging those people to recognize, like, this is a real issue. This is a real problem. There, there are things going on within this woman, so we need to surround her with love. And she talks about in her essay, like, there's just not enough. I mean, of course, you're so excited for the baby, and the baby's mm -hmm. here, but there's no, like, real caring for the mother afterwards and what may be happening to her on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so it's supporting that person, hugging that person, just loving on that person with no expectations of what they're going to get in return. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of what she really suggests and just kind of loving on the mother as much as possible. Mm -hmm. so. You know, because it's, it's, when you're in the midst of depression, whether it's postpartum or another form of clinical depression, there are irrational thoughts. And often you don't realize that it's a mental illness that you're going through. You believe those irrational thoughts. So it's really important for the people on the outside to go, hey, hey, that none of that makes sense, come here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's kind of just understanding that this is what this person is going through and, yeah. you know, it's okay to feel this way and encourage that, but also encourage getting some sort of help in some way. Yes. You know, um, you talk about the, sometimes it being hard for people to know what's going on with somebody. You, you wrote a very personal essay for cbsnews.com uh, about miscarriages, specifically the miscarriages that you've suffered. And for me, when I read it, uh, knowing you, like I know you, like I know you um, not only as a colleague, but as a friend, we've, you know, we've attended weddings together and we've had drinks together. I, I was sort of heartbroken to read that you had gone through some of these trials and tribulations and that I knew nothing about them. And you specifically talk about being a working mom, a working uh, uh, mom who is sometimes put in very difficult situations as we all are in this business and that you recognize at some level, you blame yourself at some level for the fact that you've suffered these miscarriages and you say that that's okay. And it just yeah. broke my heart to know that you were going through this and that you um, and that you were coming through it on the other end. But what did it take to write that, to share that with millions of people? Oh, millions of people. <laughs> Which is, you know, we get uh, you know, a yeah. heavily website. I, yes, we do. Um, I, think, I think a lot of it was, I, I wrote it for me. You know, I was writing it for me. I was writing it because I didn't just go through it once, but then I was going through it again. And um, I wrote it to, to just get the emotion out and to remind myself that it happened and this is why I'm feeling like this. And so I'd go back and I would read it and I would just kind of add to it little moments that I would remember <clears throat> how it made me feel. And then... Um, I had wrestled with the fact of whether I wanted to share it or not because I do want people to understand that even going through a miscarriage can then lead to some of the mental health problems that people deal with. Um, it, 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 you feel lonely, you feel you, you question yourself, embarrassed, like all of these things, you angry. I mean, I was so angry for a while and frustrated. And, and so then I sat in front of Alanis and I don't know if it was just that nostalgia that she brings, the music. I, it just was this moment where you, I sat across from her and I, I asked her in the piece, was there ever a moment where you just were like, this is too much, I can't go through this again, like I am so scared. And she's like, no, because you know what's on the other end, whether that's clarity for your mental health or a child, whatever it might be, that joy is on the other end and so uh, she said no, and like it was instant. She instantly answered that, and I just thought like, this is if, if ever there was a time, this is a time to share it. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I was so thankful to you know the CBS this morning because they allowed me to have the platform to share it as well. And right. I just want people to know that um, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's okay. And you know that was going to be my question. I was going to ask you the same question that I asked of Alanis Morissette. It. it it, to give advice, if you can, and I know in a way you're sort of still working through it yourself, right. yeah. what would you say to women who are struggling under this? Because, I, I mean, there, there are friends of mine um, that I know that have very traumatic stories of um, miscarriages. And I, I think the other yeah. thing that people don't know because yeah. women don't share, is some of these stories are, uh, you know, you talk about working, working through it, and it's, there, it's terrifying yeah. in the moment when you can't don't have access to medical care especially. Um, you know, to, what would you say to women who are beating themselves up about it? I, th <clears throat> I think what it is, what, what I've tried to come to grips with is um, it's okay to want more. Um, it's okay to, I, I have an amazing three-year-old son. I mean, he's incredible. And uh, I'm so thankful to have him in my life. Um, but I, I still want another child. And I think that some people would find that selfish mm -hmm. or um, maybe that's my own perception. But I think part of the reason why I wrote this is to share with people like I, I would go through a hundred more miscarriages if it meant having that joy, more of that in my life. And I think 
my advice is, is if that is your truth, mm -hmm. then stick to it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and be confident in it and also surround yourself with people who will support that as well, because mm -hmm. I think that's a huge part of this. Yeah, Definitely. You, know, you, you end the piece, uh, you end your essay with that very point, um, which is, and I want to just highlight that for our audience, because oftentimes people will say, well, you know, you have a, a loving husband, you have a beautiful three-year-old, and, you know, it's, it's too bad that you're not able to have another, but... You should be thankful. You, you should, should be. be happy, you should yes. be blessed. Yes. You, should, you should feel blessed because some people don't even have one. Yeah. And you, you sort of say, no, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to keep doing. It. And I thought that was the line that sort of made me cry, which is that if you have to go through a hundred miscarriages just to have another one, like your three year old, you're going to do that. That's. Just people should know that they shouldn't tell. I think you shouldn't feel bad for wanting that. At yeah. some mm -hmm. point, I will say, okay, this is enough for me, mm -hmm. whether I have another child or not. But to want it is not a bad thing. Well, there's so know? much pressure on women. You know, oh. people will sort of criticize you for wanting more. Some people will criticize you for giving up so soon. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of relentless yeah. um, for working so hard, for not working hard enough. Yeah. And, I, you know, we talked a little bit about this, that women, you know, I kind of understood the sentiment behind your piece because inevitably you blame yourself all the time for any number of failures that other people are telling you, yeah. whether you're failing as a mother, failing as an employee, failing as a, a spouse. Um, and I think it makes women particularly vulnerable when they hit a bump like like a miscarriage, you know. And the other thing we need to talk about is you know, there are hormonal things happening. Yeah. It's not yeah. just about, I'm, yeah. you know, sad about this loss. Yeah. There are hormones that you can't control, and that's why seeking a professional can make all the difference. You need Absolutely. to get the right help. Absolutely, and yeah. I'm so looking forward also to tomorrow's show on CBS This Morning, because I think that that's what this show is supposed to accomplish, is the idea that in some way, shape, or form, you know, talk to someone, get the help, reach out, because it is, it, it's, it's essential mm -hmm. to your well-being. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, you again remind me that there are people all around us. We sometimes navel gaze too yeah. often yeah. as individuals, as human beings. We think about our issues and our problems, and those are important, obviously. But we have friends, we have family, we have colleagues, people living through their own trials and tribulations that sometimes we're not aware of. And we may look at somebody and say, they've got everything that I want, or they yeah. look like yeah. they're a perfect couple, or they look like, you know, that life is going, you know, uh, smashing for them. And in fact, um, there's a lot of other things going on. So the message being, you know, sit back once in a while and ask a friend how they're doing. Absolutely. I'm so happy you wrote this. Thank yeah. you. And yeah. I encourage people to head to cbsnews.com and check out Maria's article. You know, if it's not you, maybe you know someone who's gone through this. Mm -hmm. Forward the link to them. They really, really need to read this. Indeed. Tomorrow morning, CBS This Morning will be breaking down the stigma surrounding mental health in a live audience event at 8 Eastern. It's called Stop the Stigma. And CBSN will re-air the special tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it.